Welcome to this week's service of the Ministry of the Word for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Our guest preacher this week is our former vicar, the Reverend Judith Harris Proctor, and next week we'll have with us the Reverend Elizabeth Henry McKeever. August has been such a great gift having these special preachers. We're so grateful to them. I have two announcements this week. One has to do with the parish survey. If you have not yet received an email with the parish survey, please let us know so that we can get it to you. If you have received it and have not taken the time to do, fill it out, please do so. It's important for us to hear from you as we make decisions, as we move forward as the people of God here at St. Paul's. And if you have filled out the survey, uh, thank, thank you. You'll get many reminders, but just ignore them. Thank you for filling out the survey. My second announcement has to do with our August outreach programs. Again, you have exceeded expectations. We have met and exceeded our $5,000 matching gift for the core ministries of Lazarus Ministry, serving our neighbors in need. And as you can see, as I'm here in front of this mountain of school supplies, you have been exceedingly generous with our help for our students in need in our community. Even as they do online schooling this fall, they still need lots of supplies and support. So thank you for your great generosity. Thank you, St. Paul's. Thank you for helping us to stay connected to God. Help us. Thank you for helping us stay connected to each other. And thank you for your great generosity as we continue to serve this community that we dearly love. Judith Harris Proctor, welcome back to St. Paul's. It's great to see you. Good I to see you, Warren. I, uh, uh, the common thread that's connecting all of our August preachers is that all of you began your ordained ministry here as deacons, and uh, you certainly did far more than that. Uh, for anyone who might not know the answer to this question, I don't know that there are many, uh, remind us of your connection here and the work that you did among us at St. Paul's. I did come to St. Paul's as a deacon, and uh, truth be told, I probably would still be a deacon had it not been for you, because in order to be ordained a priest, the deacon needs a job. And I had looked around um, with no opportunities on the horizon, and I had actually met you when you were canon to the ordinary in Wilmington, and um, you said, then I can't do anything because we're between bishops, but I'll keep your file, be in touch. And then it was through St. Paul's in Laurel, Maryland, where I went after graduating from, from seminary, that I met a friend we have in common. And she said, Judith, you really need to talk to Orrin Water. And I said, who is Orrin Water? And she said, oh, he was here with Jane Dixon uh, at St. Philip's in Laurel. So I called you and you said, oh, I would love to, but I have just hired a curate. So uh, he, you said, let me see what I can do. So I started out with the expectation that my stay there would be as, as short as you needed me to be there because I was I, an extra sort of, but I loved it immediately. Um, and I, I was there for 15 and a half years. <laughs> oh, the rest they say is history. It's an amazing time. What a blessing yep. for us. Okay, uh, tell us what are you doing these days? Besides have this very friendly cow looking over your shoulder, you're a, a farmer <laughs> these days. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I am doing um, a little bit of everything and probably not enough of anything. Um, I would, I would rather be busier than I am. But what I am doing is I'm on the ethics committee at the hospital. And as I have told friends from St. Paul's, this hospital is one stop sign and, no, two stop signs and one traffic light from my house. So a very different commute. I really love uh, the work of the ethics committee um, being surrounded by very bright minds and I had no idea that hospitals go to the lengths and depths and details they do ethically for individual patients. It's really uh, quite heartening um, to discover this. And I love to learn all things medical. So I, I really enjoy that. That's only once a month unless they have an emergency meeting, which they often do. Um, I am also, they have a, a, 
a television in the chapel and they do televised services. And so I do, uh, I preach and celebrate once a month for the Episcopal service. But I haven't been doing any of that since uh, March. Um, for a while at another parish, I was undertaking the pastoral care work while the rector was on sabbatical. I spend, I'm able to spend a lot of time with my grandchildren and my children, less time now because we can't see each other, but um, our closets are very organized. <laughs> Don has a friend who's a judge and, and this woman knows me, has known me since nursery school years. And when Don told her I was retiring, this friend said, does she have a label maker? <laughs> <laughs> so um you know i'm i'm happy i i would like to be doing more than i am i walk um two or three miles a day and i drive my car to a different location and then so that introduces me to a new neighborhood or an old neighborhood with new discoveries and i i i have glommed onto Loyola Blakefield, which is a high school, a Roman Catholic high school, not far from my house. I love that they're building an enormous building, which I love to watch that. There are um, students around, sort of, you know, here and there, it, somebody practicing track, or it looks like they're having football practice, believe it or not, but it's enough activity, um, enough exercise, and enough peace where I can sit and say my prayers. So I like that. Wonderful. Well, Ken, uh, out of 15 years of memories, uh, is there one that comes to mind that you'd like to share, a, a, a favorite memory of serving at St. Paul's? You know, this is the most unfair question to only <laughs> say one. So I've got to say, the thing that is uh, the most important to me in those 15 and a half years was hands down the relationships, the friendships, the, um, the, the privilege of being with people at times of great joy and great sadness. Um, and just getting to know people. I just really love that congregation still do. Wow. And um, so that, that would be the overall now, the specific, oddly enough, as I mentioned, Loyola, was the renovation. And probably everybody is tearing their hair out saying, how could you like the renovation? I really did. Um, I'm a frustrated architect, so I loved mass. So I loved all that part of it. I loved, I'm a systems person. So I loved um, the charts and the daily expectations and where the goals met and how was it going. I loved meeting all the different people. I loved working with Mari and um, Lyle Hanna. I will never forget when we had to move things out of um, Wilmer over to Norton and she went with her fancy electronic stuff and measured every piece of furniture so we could just pick it up and drop it in. Uh, that astounded me. I thought that was so cool. But then, you know, I, I love a goal and I love being part of the process to get to the goal. And so it was, I just loved everything about that. Of course, the Reverend Mother and all the decorating and the bright paint color and the girls, you know, picking out the fabric for the chairs. It was even, even uh, the foreman uh, whose name is Larry. Larry, he called him so. How's it going, Larry? So, so you know, that was, that was a great, great experience for me and um, I just loved it and then one quickie was the pig during the um campaign to to raise money to get the funds for this renovation you said if we get to this certain dollar value I will kiss a pig so that day came and I don't know how you did this but you contracted with a farmer and there was this little piglet and you said to me, okay, here, Judith, this is what we're going to do. You go outside, ask the ushers 
So this is during the church service, too, I want to tell you. Uh, you go outside, ask the ushers to leave the doors open so you can see me. And after I finish giving the intro, then you walk down with this pig. Okay, so this was a great plan. It was an adorable little piglet. And the nice lady who was managing the piglet handed it to me and said, don't worry, we have given the pig a bath this morning. Well, you went on and on and on. I thought, this pig is going to jump out of my arms and run down South Fifth Street. But that didn't happen, and I brought it down the aisle for you. <laughs> Craig, you remember that? I'd forgotten about that. So. <laughs> you that. so those, oh. those are but a few of my wonderful, wonderful memories. Thank you. Judith, it's a gift to have you back. It's great to talk with you. Thank you for saying yes to us. Oh, I'm excited. Great. Now let us uh, pause and take a deep breath, open our hearts and minds, prepare ourselves to hear and receive the living word of the living God. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you and also with you let us pray grant O merciful God that your church being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever amen A reading from the Book of Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray Psalm 138 together. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the God, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name. Because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name. And your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord. That great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, 
but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Questions. We seem to have more than our fair share of them these days, don't we? I suppose that's what caught my attention in today's gospel. With little alteration, this could be an exchange we might have today. Given the specter of the coronavirus and the uncertainty over political affairs, we could be in that crowd wondering how do we respond to those questions. Who do people say that I am? Are you the authority or some quack? Are you someone we can believe in or trust when it comes to the virus or to the candidate? Constant confusion, mixed messages, and contradicting opinions are the order of the day. In a real way, even giving the difference in how news is known and spread, the disciples were up against many of the pressures and influences we face right now. What is it that moves the needle from speculation to accusation, from accusation to proclamation? Jesus and the disciples have just made the dusty journey from Tyre and Sidon to Caesarea Philippi. This ancient city had an idyllic setting, being located in the beautiful springs forming one of the sources of the Jordan River. It also had its own geographic liability, being at the very edge of the Gentile world. In earlier times, it was known for the worship of Baal and Pan, but when Jesus and his disciples were there, it had a temple to Caesar. Was this a needlessly precarious location for Jesus to choose to reveal himself more fully to the disciples, or was it quite intentional to give us a hint that Jesus will be concerned with all people and the whole world. Jesus asked first, what, who do people say the Son of Man is? Odd, I thought. Jesus didn't go around wondering what people thought of him. There was no poll suggesting a drop in popularity, quite the reverse. So why ask what people thought? Could it suggest a kind of insecurity? a lack of confidence. Those are not traits I associate with Jesus, nor was it a kind of empty curiosity. His question was calculated and his choice of words were intentional. In using the phrase, son of man, Jesus avoided the connotations associated with the word Messiah, which is the very word that Peter uses later. People have been waiting a very long time for the Messiah. They expect that person would raise an army, drive out the Romans, and reestablish the Davidic kingdom. The Jewish imagination was exhilarated by the idea of Messiah as king, and we see the infatuation with and fre frequent images of kingship throughout the Bible. Impressive in appearance, honored and respected by all people, symbol of power and authority, dispenser of justice and mercy. This is why Jesus is so careful to distinguish between human kingship and divine kingship. Son of man was code for Messiah, as Peter figured out. To the question about people's thoughts on the Son of Man, the disciples answer in a variety of voices and with a variety of names. Their multiple choice guaranteed no agreement. Remember that trick in school when you were unsure of how to spell a word, 
So you used it three times in the essay, each time spelling it differently, calculating that one of those times would be the right spelling. Maybe the disciples were operating on a similar principle. Notice though that all the names they gave were names of people who were dead. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, and other prophets. Ironic that when asking about the living God, only the names they give are of people who have died. Jesus then asks, but who do you say that I am? Good old Peter, not often head of the class, blurts out, you were the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus quickly acknowledges Peter's aptitude, blesses him and praises him for reala realizing that flesh and blood had not been revealed to him except by the Father in heaven. We can appreciate Peter's courage in answering as he did when we remember the time and place. When the Gospel of Matthew was written, the people knew all too well that the Roman commander who led the destruction of Jerusalem had returned with his troops to the very place where Jesus was, Caesarea Philippi, to celebrate their victory. So when Jesus asks, but who do you say that I am? The question hangs thick over the tense in atmosphere of religious influence, economic trade, and the power of an empire. Peter's answer shows his allegiance. It shows he places his trust, not in privileges made possible by wealth and opportunity. It shows that he will not worship the latest, flashiest idol nor will he get behind the dominant power of whatever ruler is currently in favor. He will follow the one true and living God. Questions have a way of marking important moments in time. I think that's exactly what's going on here. After years of teaching, healing, and traveling, Jesus brings the disciples to the point of a clear recognition of who he is and the important role they will play. The disciples lived in a world where the voices of different religious parties held sway. In the mix were the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Pharisees, and the Zealots. Names have changed, but it's little different for us. It's not just who we listen to, but who we trust. Who do we trust enough to follow? Our questions are different these days. When can we worship in church? When will schools be open for in-person learning? When will there be a safe and effective vaccine? Urgent for too many people are questions like, will I be rehired for my old job? Will I have enough money to feed my family? Will I be evicted? And for others, will mail-in ballots be safe? Will foreign countries interfere? How will the elections go? The pressures and uncertainties of our day are different from the ones the disciples faced, but there is one constant in, the, constant in the midst of all that is uncertain then and now, and that is the presence of God. Ours is a God who never stops creating, who never stops loving, who never stops believing in us. If we were asked, who do people say that we are, could we answer? someone who helps to ease the burdens of others, someone who is faithful to the word of God, and someone who sets an example of Christian love and fellowship. We hope for much these days, the hope that is central to our faith and that is that we are constantly a part of the vision of God, that he may be known to the ends of the earth. We can be the person who soothes the fears of those who are afraid, we can be the person who attends to those who feel forgotten. And we can be the person who keeps faith alive by confidence and trust in our God and in our future. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now proclaim our faith and say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, 
We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for this parish family that we may be renewed in mind and spirit and become persons of love and service in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer. We pray for an openness to the gifts of God, that we who are clothed in the likeliness of God may live lives worthy of our calling. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer. We pray for the people of this land and of all the nations. Guide them in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer. We pray for the poor, the weak, the needy, and all those who struggle in any way, that they be relieved and protected. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer. We pray for peace in all places of violence and injustice, that God will turn our hearts and help us all to recognize the dignity and value of all people. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer. We invite you to offer your own prayers and thanksgivings at this time. In our Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the province of Southeast Asia. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the ministry of Sunday school teachers and youth leaders. We pray for all those in need of God's healing in mind, body, and spirit, especially Charles, Tom, David, Emily, Marion, Amanda, and Harvey. And we pray for those who have died, especially Mario Narilli, and Carter Holland. We give thanks for the many blessings of life and especially for the birth of Jack Hall Taylor, son of Blair and Fulton Taylor. In this time of pandemic, we pray for all those who have died of the coronavirus. We pray for all who are sick, those who care for them, and for those most vulnerable to its spread. We pray for health workers, for first responders, for those who work in public places, and all who put their own lives at risk to provide for our needs. We pray for scientists and doctors working on vaccines and therapies. We pray for those working from home and for those who have been furloughed or, un or unemployed. We pray for all who are suffering from loneliness and anxiety. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, 
and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We conclude our prayers by singing the St. Paul's Children's Prayer. For this new morning with its light, for rest and shelter of the night, for health and food, for love and friends, for every gift your goodness sends, we thank you, gracious Lord. Amen. We thank you, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us now pray in the words that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God, the Almighty and all-loving Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.